Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg. I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're talking about supporting queer, trans, non-binary folks in pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. And to have this conversation, I spoke with Beth Harding. She is a doula, a childbirth educator, and a board-certified music therapist. And Beth identifies as queer and specializes in supporting LGBTQIA plus families through the family building journey. She is a mom of two, and she lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. And after we finished our interview, she and I stayed on the line a little longer, and it was really fun talking to her. I found out that she went to Berklee School of Music for her music therapy, and I went to Boston Conservatory for musical theater, and they are partner schools, and we chatted all about life in Boston as a student. So I really, I really enjoyed her, and she's, she's just a really great person, easy to listen to, and she offers some amazing information about how someone that is queer or trans or a non-binary and I can make sure they have a really supportive birth team. They can find support in the hospital setting, looking about lactation, uh, postpartum for trans folks. It was just a really great conversation. Even if you don't identify as queer or trans or or non-binary, it's important to be able to have an open mind to other people's way of living with respect. So I think you're going to enjoy that conversation. Before we get to that, I wanted to thank... Jillian, who left a really nice message on our Apple podcast for a review. She said, loving it. There is so much wonderful information in these podcasts and now the wealth of resources to continue your exploration. I highly recommend them for any pregnant mama or those with little ones. So I want to say thank you, Jillian. I appreciate you taking the time to leave a rating and review. It helps people find the podcast. So if you have a moment, I would appreciate if you could hop over to wherever you listen to the podcast from and leave a rating and review. I also want to say thank you for everyone that continues to show up for classes online. I just love getting to learn about the community. We always start with circle time where people say their name and how far along they are. And we've added in where you're tuning in from. And in the beginning, yeah, it was a lot in New York, but now it's amazing. We have people from Canada. We have someone that tunes in from France. We have a lot of people on the West Coast. So our walls are expanding and expanding. Our community is growing and growing, and we keep showing up for each other. And it just is beautiful. And then the last thing before we listen to this wonderful interview is just to shout out for our teacher training. I can't believe we're going to be starting our January, February teacher training soon. And there's three spots left as of now. So if prenatal yoga is a passion of yours, you want to show up and support pregnant folks, take a look at our website, prenatalyogacenter.com to see what we can do for you, how we can work together. It's a very in-depth training. Uh, I'm quite passionate about it. I take a lot of my knowledge as a Lamaze teacher, as a doula, as a parent, as someone who has birthed, and I tie it all into this training. I'm really, really proud of it. So check it out. We have a few spots left for January and February. We have March and April, and then we got to figure out next fall. I hope that we're no longer in COVID land. So we'll see what that looks like. All right. We're going to take a super quick break. And when we come back, please enjoy my conversation with Beth. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. 
The Skylight Calendar is a smart touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Hi, Beth. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Oh, I'm really, really excited to jump into this. So I guess before we get into all my questions about supporting queer and trans and non-binary folks in pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I want to know a little bit about you. So give me a little of your background. And also, I know you're a birth doula, how you got started in all of the birth work and also your focus on, I'm going to see if I can get all the letters correct, LGBTQIA plus families. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's a mouthful. Um, yeah, so I have been a birth worker for about 10 years, um, a doula, and I am now a childbirth educator um, with a company called Birth Smarter. And I got into birth work because I've always been really passionate about birth. And it's always been something that's super interesting to me. Um, I've been a doula way before I had children of my own. And it's just something that I feel like is my calling. Um, I grew up in Colorado and have moved around quite a bit. I now live in Salt Lake City, Utah. And through my my growing up and my my uh, my family was very um open about birth and I, we always had interesting books there on the bookshelf about birth and so it just kind of made it something that was curious to me and interesting. And so I also have two children of my own. Um, I identify as queer myself. My husband is transgender. And so our journey of becoming parents was quite a long and intense journey because as we'll talk about today, a lot of parents, uh, people who, who want to become parents that are, that identify as queer, um, it's not always a super clear, easy path. And so, for me, um, I, I have two boys, two two sons, and I got pregnant through IVF and using donor sperm, and um, and that's kind of, I think, why I'm so drawn to working within the LGBTQ community is because I identify within that community, but I also see that there's a huge need and a huge, um, yeah, there's just a need there for good, competent care. And I kind of see myself as someone who I, I do a lot of education in my community to other birth workers about how to be awesome birth workers for queer folks so that there's just more opportunities and more people out there that are that are affirming and that are educated and knowledgeable about how to work with queer families. So that's kind of what I what I'm up to these days. That's a that's a a lot of work that you seem to be doing that's so needed. It really is. It's something through my years as a birth worker, I will admit I have not had a lot of training um, on like formal training or, you know, I've done some online courses. I've listened to podcasts, but when I became a doula, which was like 17 years ago, yeah. it, it just wasn't part of the conversation. So it's exciting that we're bringing this up and it's, and that you are working with those families as well as with birth workers so that people can be yeah. sensitive and open. So I did not know some of the additional letters. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I didn't know the I a and plus. Um, yeah. so can you, can you go over the definition of all of those? Absolutely. So it's kind of a lot. So just know going into it that it's like, I'm going to throw a lot of terms at you and information that might feel a little bit overwhelming to listeners, but that's just kind of part of it is learning a little bit of a new language. Some people it's a little daunting, but it's, it's like learning anything. It's just starting. So mm. I'm going to start with the LGBTQIA plus acronym. So L is for lesbian, which is a, a person who identifies as a woman who is attracted to other women. G is for gay, which is a person who identifies as male who is attracted to other men. Um, B is bisexual. 
that's someone who is attracted to people of both genders or bisexual and pansexual or is now kind of the term that many people are using instead of bisexual. Um, it's basically pan is referring to more than two. Um, even bisexual is really binary. It's like either or, right? And so pansexual is a little bit more, more broad and fluid. Uh, the T stands for transgender and transgender doesn't refer to who someone is attracted to. It refers to who they see themselves as, the, the gender that they perceive themselves to be. So transgender is an umbrella term and it refers to people whose gender identity is different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. So a transgender person can identify as any sexual orientation. They can identify as straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc. anything. Um, and the transgender part is what refers to their gender identity. The Q in the acronym stands for queer. And that's a term that people, it's kind of another umbrella term. So it's another term that people use to express a spectrum of identities and orientations that are just somewhere outside of the mainstream heterosexual box. It's kind of a catch-all term. It was once used as a slur, um, and it's been it's been reclaimed by the by the LGBT community. At least most most of the community uses it as a positive word. Q can also stand now for questioning, so it's kind of a double one. Questioning is basically a term that someone might use for themselves when they're in the process of exploring their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So they're somewhere in that kind of exploratory process of questioning. The I stands for intersex. So intersex people are born with a variety of differences in their sex traits and their reproductive anatomy, including differences in their genitalia, their chromosomes, hormone production. This is another one that does not refer to sexual orientation. So an intersex person can identify as straight, as gay, as queer, as bi, as pan, as lesbian, anything. So intersex refers to, again, their, their physical and hormonal um, makeup and how they might be born with a variety of differences there. And the A uh, can be either asexual, which is someone with a lack of sexual attraction or desire for other people entirely, or it can also stand for ally. And that's someone who actively supports LGBTQ people. Um, it can be someone outside of the queer community or it could be someone within the queer community, like, like, let's say a lesbian might be an ally to transgender people. They might be someone who's educated, who's standing up for, for trans people. So it can be kind of anyone who's within or without the community that is really actively supporting um, that community. And then the plus at the end of the acronym really is there to signify that there's even more terms that fall under the umbrella of LGBTQIA+. Um, it's kind of, it can be overwhelming. Um, I think most people shorten it to either LGBTQIA+, or LGBTQ, or just queer is what I use a lot because it's, it's, it's an umbrella term that kind of, again, refers to all of many, many, many different gender identities and sexual orientation. So LGBTQ, I would say, are the most used of the acronym um, as far as what you might see written in, in media or hear about in, in podcasts and shows and things like that. Um, but just know that there are more, um, more letters that fall under the acronym as well. So that's that. It's <laughs> no, it's, thank you. Because I, I, yeah, I, I was familiar with the LGBTQ and I'm like, Oh, what is the, so I actually looked yeah. it up and I'm like, Oh yeah. God, I got, I got, I got, I got the I and A yeah. plus. So, yeah. but that's yeah. great because even I love that there's the plus because there's so many more options. Again, if we're trying to be inclusive. We don't yeah. want to say you can only fall within these letters. Right. So can you also then start to explain the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity? Yeah. So I kind of touched on it a little bit, but I didn't explain it. So what it is, basically sexual orientation refers to who a person is attracted to. Um, and gender identity refers to how a person views themselves, whether that's male or female or somewhere in between or somewhere totally outside that binary altogether. So someone, um, someone's gender identity can be the same or different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. So if someone at birth 
was assigned female, let's say, and they identify as female, then a term that is used for them is cisgender. It's C-I-S gender. The prefix cis means on the same side of. So that's someone who identifies as the sex they were assigned at birth. If someone's gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth, so if they were assigned female at birth and they identify as male, they might be considered transgender. So trans, that prefix, means on the other side of. So cisgender and transgender are terms that people might hear um, when talking about gender identity. That's kind of the difference between that and sexual orientation, which is basically who you're attracted to. Thank you. So I really just want to kind of get those understandings and definitions per se out there. So as we start to talk, we're all kind of on that same page. So I'm excited to start talking about family planning. We just actually did a podcast with um, a lesbian uh, person who talked about her journey into... I I know. Kathleen was awesome. I really... I hope you're listening. She was awesome. So I I have um, a little bit of understanding, but I love that you can also bring your background because you had to go through donors as well. So, and I'm sure there's many barriers that queer and trans and non-binary folks face mm-hmm. when they're starting to talk reproductive care. And, and Catalina gave her background and it was, it was pretty easy for her. She had a, like, she had a friend that had extra sperm. Like, how great right. is that? Um, but <laughs> yeah. I feel like that was kind of the unicorn of situations. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you can refer to yourself or just, you know, your experience or not, or just, the the barriers of finding a donor, a donor um, working with fertility clinics, and just kind of moving through that process of getting pregnant. Totally. Yeah. So just getting pregnant for queer people can be a huge undertaking. Like some people have that awesome experience where it's like, oh, it was really easy. I had a friend who gave me some sperm and I got pregnant. Super boom, boom, boom. Or I had a friend who was willing to be a surrogate. If it's, if it's two men that are trying to have a baby, they might need a surrogate. So it can be easy. Um, I would say most of the time it's not most of the time it's, it's a very big undertaking and it's a big financial piece of that too. So, um, you know, purchasing donor sperm, paying for a surrogate, um, fertility treatment, sometimes like IVF, it's, it's extremely expensive. And so there's just that factor of, can we even afford to do this and how can we do this? Um, also, fertility clinics might not even be what people need. So I think sometimes um, queer people get caught up in this this fertility clinic culture where, like, they're at a fertility clinic and they might think, oh, I must be infertile because I'm at a fertility clinic. And the fertility clinic is kind of – they have this view of, okay, what's – what? why are you infertile? What do we need to do? Do we need to do IVF, et cetera? When really what might be the issue is they just need someone to inseminate them with sperm. Like they might not have a fertility problem. They might just need the the sperm and someone to help them get it to the egg. Mm -hmm. Um, And fertility clinics can be awesome. They can also be a little bit challenging because sometimes they're not really educated in, in how to work with queer people. So for some folks that go to a fertility clinic, they might go in the, on the website, it might say, oh yeah, we work with all families. And then they might get there and go in the waiting room. And it's like all straight couples, brochures with all straight couples on the, on the brochures, magazines with all straight people. Um, no, no sense of like, oh, they, they see me, they're understanding. They want me here. It's kind of a sense of like, oh, I, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. This isn't for me. Um, and so there, there can, there's a lot of opportunity for growth there within and and learning and education within the fertility kind of world. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's just not something that's super simple and easy for most queer folks to do to start a family. Um, and so I think that's important for, for providers to understand that typically by the time someone might meet with a a fertility doctor or, or a midwife, um, or a fertility doula, they might already have had years of like trying to figure this out on their own or trying other ways of getting pregnant. And there can be a lot of disappointment there and grief and financial hardship. And so it's, it's really important to kind of come to the situation as a provider with really open arms and, and, willingness to listen to their story and where they've been and what they've been trying and, um, and really be, be an advocate and be part of their team to like try to help them to get pregnant because it's, it's definitely, um, 
definitely a journey for sure. Did you find, or how did you find the fertility clinic that you worked with? Um, or maybe or did you find a, I guess I should ask, did you yeah. find yeah, so my my journey was a little bit long. I I tried just getting pregnant with donor sperm using an at home midwife, doing it at my house, doing intrauterine insemination, um, which is basically just putting the sperm into the uterus and during a fertile window, and and hoping for the best, like hoping it takes. And that's kind of the, I would say the least. Uh, invasive option. And I tried that 10 times, um, with two different sperm donors, couple different midwives, just seeing what, why it wasn't working. Usually people that do intrauterine insemination, typically it, it, it works. They get pregnant within around two to four times. So, so 10 tries is a lot. Um, it must have very emotional too. It was, you know, it's like every time, you know, uh, you get your hopes up and you think, okay, it's going to be it. And, and I think I, like many people just had the, had the assumption that it was going to be really easy. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just get pregnant. Right. Like that's what happens. Right. You just, you just put the sperm in there and then you get pregnant. Like that's kind of how it goes. And I was just, it just took a lot out of me to say like, oh wow. Okay. It didn't happen again this month. I wonder why. Okay. It didn't happen again this month. Okay. It took and again and again. And so it just became exhausting. Um, we ended up going to a fertility clinic to see, you know, what's the next step or can we do something differently? And the doctor there was like, I would recommend you just go ahead and do IVF because for some reason, like we don't know why it hasn't worked. Um, but it hasn't worked and IVF has a more, you know, higher success rate and it's, let's just do it. And so, you know, that was something I thought I'd never have to do because IVF is extremely expensive. I would say it's about 10 grand or so, probably if I remember correctly, just to do IVF and most insurances don't cover it. And so it's a huge undertaking financially and emotionally. Um, there's a lot of drugs involved that kind of mess with the hormones and there's just, it's just a lot. It's a roller coaster. And so, um, I had the wonderful joy of getting pregnant the first with the first embryo that we, we got and unfortunately had a miscarriage about seven weeks in and, and then, uh, got pregnant with the second embryo and that was my son, Shay. And the third, Your son is the, Shay? I have a <laughs> yeah. Shay too. <laughs> you do? Oh my God. That's awesome. So I totally best. interrupted because it's yeah. such a, a unique name. So yeah. Okay. Totally. Sorry. Yeah. Yay for the no, Shays. <laughs> it's, a good name. it's a good name. Yeah. So he was my firstborn and then I had one more embryo and tried one more time and got pregnant with my second son, Jack. And so it was Definitely a roller coaster, you know, emotionally exhausting. Um, I wouldn't trade it for the world, obviously. My boys are everything. But yeah, I'm kinda glad that journey for me is over. <laughs> like I'm done having children and I'm like, I'm good, I'm I'm done because it is just so much um emotional turmoil to go through. But I think it makes you a really special doula and childbirth educator to have gone through that, that you can really hold the space and understand what those that are working through that have gone, are going through, as well as those that finally got pregnant and are so excited to watch their family grow. Totally. You'd mentioned, um, a fertility doula. I'm unfamiliar with that. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And I am not one, but I've read about them and kind of understand a little bit about what they do. So a fertility doula is, is someone who supports people in that journey to become pregnant, regardless of like, of what the journey looks like. Um, so they might do things like in-person or phone check-ins to process like what the, what the folks are going through. So if they're doing IVF, let's say, and they're, they have a lot of doctor's appointments and they have uh, a calendar of when they need to take all their medications and it's just overwhelming. Um, that fertility doula might be the person that they check in with to, to process the emotional ups and downs of the journey. Um, they could even go with people to the appointments so that they have that extra person there to ask questions or to feel like they have an interpreter. If there's things they don't understand, um, to talk it through with them. Um, that fertility doula can also provide resources and, and referrals to other community clinicians that might be kind of a complementary clinician. So if you're going through fertility treatments and maybe acupuncture might be a good thing to try and massage to kind of decrease your stress, things like that. So they could refer you to people in the community who are, who are good clinicians for that. 
And they can also help you to put together a a fertility plan. So like a plan for how are we going to get pregnant? What are we going to try? Um, and they can be kind of your guide through that. So that's, that's what a fertility doula does. Oh, it seems like everyone that is struggling with fertility issues should have a fertility doula. Totally. It's just another, I mean, I think doulas in general, like all, everyone needs support. Who doesn't need I know. support? Everyone it's an amazing a, thing. Yeah, yeah. Everyone should have a lifelong support person. I totally okay, agree. we're going to take a super quick break. When we, when we come back, I want to talk about the importance of finding the right birth team. All right, we'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Frame. Mother's Day is almost here. What are you getting her? Something that shows you care. Something that makes her feel loved. Something that won't stress you out. Something like the Skylight Frame. The Skylight Frame is the perfect gift. It's a touchscreen photo frame your whole family can upload photos to from wherever they are in the world. It's a way to share with her all the moments that matter. It sets up in seconds. You can even make sure that it's already loaded with photos when your mom opens her Mother's Day gift. And her Skylight Frame can hold thousands of the treasured photos you share. It's an easy, heartfelt way for mom to stay connected with those who matter most. It really is the perfect gift. Now, as a special Mother's Day offer for our listeners, Get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightframe.com slash easy. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Frame. Mother's Day is almost here. What are you getting her? Something that shows you care. Something that makes her feel loved. Something that won't stress you out. Something like the Skylight Frame. The Skylight Frame is the perfect gift. It's a touchscreen photo frame your whole family can upload photos to from wherever they are in the world. It's a way to share with her all the moments that matter. It sets up in seconds. You can even make sure that it's already loaded with photos when your mom opens her Mother's Day gift. And her Skylight Frame can hold thousands of the treasured photos you share. It's an easy, heartfelt way for mom to stay connected with those who matter most. It really is the perfect gift. Now, as a special Mother's Day offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightframe.com slash easy. Okay, we're back. So I found this really interesting study. So hopefully I can get this correct. Transgender non-inclusive healthcare and delaying care because of fear. Connections to general health and mental health among transgender adults. Woo, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> it was a really interesting study. I kind of dug deep into that. So that's just starting to speak to the importance of finding the right birth team and the challenges that queer and trans and um, non-binary folks face when they're trying to find people that understand and respect and hold the space for them. Can you go into that a little bit and also how to find the right fit? Absolutely. So there's been some incredible studies out there that show there's one that uh, we can link to called transgender men in pregnancy also that showed that over 40% of trans people that birth work with a midwife rather than an OB and only 8% of cisgender birthers do that. So it's a huge amount of trans people who choose to work with midwives. And I think that speaks to the disparities that a lot of trans people face within the traditional health care system. Um, and there can be a distrust for the system for sure, because of a lifetime of microaggressions, such as like misgendering, calling someone the wrong gender, using the wrong name for someone, um, having to explain their gender identity like over and over to every single provider that comes in the room and even things like overt discrimination. So providers that might refuse to use the right pronouns for someone or even refusing to provide care. Like we think it, you know, as, as people maybe who aren't trans or who aren't um, queer, maybe don't understand or might think that doesn't really happen. Like, no way that can't really happen. Right. But it, it does happen. Um, And so a lot of trans and queer people just have a mistrust for the system and don't, don't really want to work within that hospital system. And so they find other providers, um, and finding a, finding a good birth team and a provider who feels like it's the right fit. I would say it's, it's not easy. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it and be like, Oh yeah, it's super easy to find like queer affirming providers 
in every city everywhere. Like it's, it's not always. And so I think that asking for referrals from other queer people, that you know, like acquaintances or friends who have gotten pregnant, ask them who they used, ask them what they thought about that person. Um, and really try to find out, get a kind of a word of mouth referral. And if, if there's not someone local in your city to ask, then go on Facebook. There's a bunch of groups on Facebook. You can search for like queer parenting groups, um, queer fertility groups, trans fertility and pregnancy groups. And on those groups, you can put out there, Hey, I'm in such and such city. I'm looking for an OB or I'm looking for a midwife. I'm looking for a doula. Does anyone know of anybody? And that can be a really good way to find people. And, and then you can also see if your local pride center, most cities have a pride center, an LGBT center of some kind. And sometimes they'll have a directory there of healthcare providers. Um, and that might be a good place to look. And then definitely interview providers. So don't just like go with the first person that you find and assume it's going to be a good fit. Meet with them, ask them if they can set up, if you can set up an interview with them and, and really, I would say like, go for it, like go for the hard questions, ask them about their experience working with LGBT people. And, and I wouldn't even ask it in like a yes or no question. Like, Oh, have you worked with queer people before? Because that can be easy to just be like, Oh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean like, how did you work with them? What kind of support so exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cause you don't want to just get sure. It's kind of like, it's like yeah. when I've had clients like, do you do VBEX? Sure. And then yeah. they get to like 36 weeks and they're scheduling their C-section. Exactly. Same exact thing. Yeah. So really asking them like, what was the experience like? Do you have anyone that you can give me their number for a reference? And OBs may, may not be as open to that, but a lot of midwives and doulas, absolutely. They'll, they'll, ask their client, Hey, this person wants to hire me, but they want to talk to a a person I've worked with. Can they, can I give you their number? And, and they might get to talk to someone who's actually worked with that clinician and and really ask them what their experience was like. So definitely interviewing people is huge. Um, and then we'll talk, I want to talk at some point too, about how important doulas are. And I think that might be maybe in the, the next little part we talk about, because I think a doula can really help a person to, to navigate the whole pregnancy and birth experience. Yeah, absolutely. I just, as you were talking about that, and I remember reading the study about the idea of delaying care because of fear. I can imagine people delaying care altogether or just like not seeking it. And, and that can be dangerous for everyone involved. I know there's a whole free birthing. I'm not going to go into that world, but um, (laughs) (laughs) let's leave that off the side for now. Um, But it just, it's sad. It's, it's yeah. sad. It makes, that's why when I started reading this, I'm like, we need to go there in this. So thank you. Cause I also been thinking like birth in general has fear of the unknown and mm. we're asking people to try to soften that fear and, and trust their bodies. But if they're, if the care provider doesn't even trust them or respect them, I couldn't imagine being able to physically and emotionally open up. Right. So yeah, it's, totally doesn't make any sense. That's exactly what needs to happen in birth, right? Is we need to feel safe and comfortable and and like we're in an environment that we can let go and surrender. And if you're not surrounded by people who support you and who even are calling you the wrong gender or thinking that your partner is your sister or something, like how horrible is that? And how sad is that? And how, like, how much work do we have to do as a system and as providers to make that not a reality for people because it's not okay. So let's bring that into finding like the hospital staff. So mm-hmm. that, so maybe someone finds the doctor or the, or the midwife yeah. or whoever, some sort of care provider that they trust. They know they're going to support them. I have this, yep. I have some weird sayings. I got like circling the wagons where the team yes. <laughs> creates this. It's a very strange image, image. I've had this for years that the team yeah. creates this like, circle of protection with the birthing person in the center. So the birthing person can do what they want. So they found their team and they're circling the wagons. But if the hospital staff is Mm -hmm. not supportive, that can be really challenging. And that can also start to weaken the system they've created. So what can the birthing person do to have the, the support system be advocates for them? Yeah, that's a huge thing. Because if you think about it, they might think, oh, my OB is awesome, but they only interact with their OB so much. Time. much. <laughs> like, yeah, in labor, they're interacting with nurses and anesthesiologists and, you know, nurses assistants and janitors, people coming in, the, like anyone who comes in the room who's just like not part of that 
aware team is going to potentially have a negative effect on the birth. So I would say my first suggestion is to hire a doula because a doula can be a really good kind of a go between an advocate if the staff is having a hard time with pronouns, let's say, or is being kind of insensitive in any way, that doula can be the person to kind of take the staff aside and say, hey, like, did you know that this is the pronoun they use? Or can you please change what you're saying in this way or do something differently in this way? Um, I would say if you do hire a doula to make sure you really talk with them in depth prenatally about how much support you think you're going to need with interacting with staff. Um, and make sure that your doula is really comfortable speaking up and correcting the staff over and over and over and over and over again if the staff is using the wrong pronouns or makes incorrect assumptions. So that make sure that your doula is someone who's like, I will stand up for you. I will advocate. I will be that voice if you need me to be while you're laboring so that I can be the one that is the go-between person. Um, and then another suggestion is to create a sign for the hospital door um, fold it over so that it's not just opened and, you know, for confidentiality's sake. So it's like a piece of paper on the door. You can fold it in half so not anyone can see it. But on the outside, I would say have written all staff, please read before entering. And then when they open it up, unfold it, look inside. I would say to have kind of a, like a little welcome to us, welcome to our family blurb. So you could even put a picture of you and your partner who whoever's supporting you in your birth. You can say, hey, my name is such and such. I use such and such pronouns. I identify as this. I'm excited to be here having a baby. Um, if you have questions about something, please discreetly direct those questions to my doula when there's a moment, you know, an opportune moment. And that's kind of a way that I think people can kind of in, introduce themselves to the staff in a positive way. So the staff isn't going in blind too, because it's not always the staff's like, they're not always um, malicious. They're not always like trying to be insensitive. It's just, they may not even know or have been told by somebody that this person identifies as trans or is in a same sex relationship or whatever it is. And so they might go into the room thinking they're going to see something and then they see something else and they're just like confused and they're like, wait, wait, I'm, wait, wh who are you? What's happening? And so giving them that opportunity to learn and be like it, in the know, it can help the staff to feel like, oh, okay, cool. I can do this. Um, and I then love that them. idea. I used yeah. to do that for um, some of my clients when they were having a physiological birth and they did not want to be offered pain medication. Yes. So I'd put a sign on the door saying physiological birth in progress. Do not offer drugs. We will ask when we need. And yes. that just sometimes stopped the anesthesiologist from coming in and be like, hi, I've got the epidural when you want it, <laughs> which is a very valid choice. But it's like if you're yeah. in labor, you don't, yeah. you don't want it there. But I'd yeah. never thought that there's other uses. And that is, that is such a good idea because it gives somebody yeah. a moment to take a beat, kind of yep. rearrange their mouth so they don't say something stupid yep. and, and be there open-mindedly. I love that. Yeah. that is, yeah. It's a really good tool. That is brilliant. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to postpartum. Unless there's anything else you want to yeah. jump in about supporting uh, birthing people during labor. No, I think that's, that's right. good. Cool. All right. So let's talk about transgender folks, how they can get supportive lactation support postpartum. Yes, yes, yes. So there's a couple of good websites online articles. So kellymom.com is a great yes. resource for anyone for yes. sure for lactation. It's like <laughs> my favorite resource. Um, if you go, I know we're going to have this in the show notes, but if you go to like Kelly mom, like Google Kelly mom, um, trans, transgender lactation. There's a really great article, um, and it's all about trans lactation. And it, within that article, it even has further reading and further links. Um, and so I would say that would be my number one suggestion is checking out Kelly mom. And I think the website itself is a little hard to navigate. So I think Googling it is the better way to find it. Like, as opposed to going to the website and trying to find it within the website, it's tricky. So Another one that I found actually just like searching around online, which I was really stoked about is, um, a company called happy milk lactation support. They're based in the Bay area in California, but they also do virtual support and they had a really robust, like 
LGBTQ resources page on their website. I was really excited about it. And on that page, they had, again, a bunch of links to resources, to articles, to, you know, suggestions and groups that you can find and join. So I would say checking those two resources out would be great. Kelly mom and happy milk lactation. Um, honestly, it might be hard to find a lactation consultant in your area that is super, you know, knowledgeable about, um, trans folks or about inducing lactation for like a non-gestational parent. And so virtual support might end up being what ends up being the best fit, which is okay. And right now, you know, we're all doing virtual stuff because of COVID and it's turned out to be like, not that bad in, in many respects. And so if you can find a lactation consultant, even if they're somewhere in some other city that can do virtual support for you, um, that's going to be a great option for many people that are trans and queer. I do know some lactation consultants that have worked with um, lesbian couples that have gotten both parents uh, breastfeeding. And I was yeah. at first, I'm like, I didn't even know that could happen. And then she's like, yep. it certainly can. <laughs> and so it's super cool. It's, it's super it cool. It really is. I really think it's a, such an amazing family opportunity for, for those yeah. folks. So yeah. I also know that going into a birthing class, say you're yeah. Um, you know, a, a non-binary person, a trans, um, you know, queer person in a very cis gendered birthing class may feel like it doesn't quite fit you. So yeah. what should somebody look for when they're choosing a birthing class? Like how is, how can it be queer family friendly? Yeah, totally. So I think starting with looking at like finding a class that uses language to reflect various kinds of families and uses images to reflect those families. So like even just Googling around, like looking for something in your area or online and looking at like how they refer to things on their website, even if they say everything is mamas, everything is women, Mm. everything is goddesses. And like, that's cool if that's what you're looking for. But if that's not you, then I would say don't even bother, you know, because if that's kind of what they're putting out there, then that's the clientele that they're looking to attract. And so look for a birthing class that uses language that's gender neutral in general. Like all of the birth classes that I teach at Birth Smarter, all of our birth classes in general are all gender neutral, no matter if it's a queer birth class or if it's just a birth class for anybody. We just use gender neutral language because I feel like that just automatically is so much more inclusive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't negate women. It doesn't negate moms. It's like, we can still talk about moms and women and dads. All that's awesome. And we can also make space for folks who don't identify as women or as moms, you know? And so I think it's, it's all just about creating even more expansion and more space within the birth world and never taking away. We're not taking away anything. We're just adding to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I've and seen I, that really change in the birth world in the yeah. last few years. It's really, yeah. it's really exciting to see that. We actually changed our whole entire teacher training manual nice. to reflect that. That is uh, awesome. Yeah. I have still a That's few so random great. pages where we're like, oops, we missed this one. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but I, I think it's so important. And it, and for some folks, it's hard to get, like, I know our teacher trainees, it's something we have to really stick with. Um, so how do you, when you're working with, well, or let me back it up. When mm-hmm. you're teaching childbirth ed and you have, um, do you ever have pushback from some couples that are cyst and they're like, why can't I use mom or whatever? I don't, oh, I haven't experienced pushback at this point. I think because, um, the, I think because times are changing and I think people often like people that sign up for birth smarter, they sign up because they want a specific type of class. They want something that's going to be super up to date and super like, um, like modern, not, an- not antiquated. It's not an old school birth class where it's, it's, it's very much about society right now. And so I think people aren't surprised when they come up, come up against gender neutral language. And like I said, like, we're not saying, Oh, we don't use those terms. We don't use woman or mom. Like we might interchange that if someone identifies as a mom and mama, then we're going to reflect that language back to them. You know, it's, that's kind of what it's all about with trans and gender queer folks too, is like reflecting the language that they use about themselves. So one question that I ask in the beginning of all my childbirth ed classes is what do you want your kids to call you? 
And that gives people a chance to be like, oh, I want to be called Baba or I want to be called Papa. I want to be called Mom. I want to be called, you know, Zaza, whatever. Like people come up with all sorts of fun names. I like Zaza. (laughs) Zaza, why not? Like Zaza, right? Whatever you want. And, And that gives people a chance to be seen really and be like, oh, they're asking me a question about me and they want to know about how I identify, you know? And so... I think it's just, yeah, it's all about making space for everybody. That's Um, important. Yeah. And then I teach a class specifically for queer parents too, or queer people. So I think that like having classes that are all gender neutral language is awesome, but also having a class that's specifically for queer families that's taught by a queer person is even better because there's like, there's that lived experience and that understanding there. And there's a space for some really amazing community to form Mm -hmm. with families that are similar. So I think I just love it. I, it's a one day class. Um, and it's like a six hour class. It's amazing. It's all of our classes are built around two pillars, which is one, the physiology of birth. So like how a baby gets from inside to outside. And then the second pillar is the societal context of giving birth right now in this time, in this place where you live about how our hospital culture is, how our, our American culture is society. So it's a very personalized class and it gives people the chance to to take what we teach and adapt it and improvise with it with whatever kind of birth they have so that there's not an expectation of oh you need to have an unmedicated vaginal birth like no way we're just like here's what's happening in your body here's what has to happen to get the baby out and here's how you can use this information to adapt and go with the flow no matter what kind of twists and turns your birth takes and so it's it's pretty amazing. We break it down into three key actions of what happens in the birth process. And we let partners really explore and learn about how they can support their person too. We give five partner responsibilities. Like here's your five things that you focus on as a partner, um, what you're in charge of. And that I think gives people really tangible takeaways that they can feel like, okay, I got this. I know what I'm doing no matter where our birth goes or how it goes or what happens, we can adapt and improvise in the moment. That's great. Are there any particular resources for queer, trans, and non-binary folks who are heading into pregnancy? I know that you gave me a bunch of links. Is there anyone that you want to particularly highlight? I know we talked about um, the Kelly Mom. What else is there? Yeah, so um, there's kind of a newer website called transfertility.co. So it's not even .com, it's .co, transfertility.co. That's a great website because it has kind of a link or a section for trans folks who are getting pregnant. And there's also a section for providers who want to learn more and take trainings. Um, There's also some books out there. I, a lot of the books that are written, unfortunately, I feel like there's a big gap. There's like not a good book out there really for queer folks who that, that really sees people as intersectional beings. A lot of the books are very white and very like lesbian white women, um, affluent women. So it's, I don't know that we got to We got to write that book. Like that book needs to be written. There is a podcast that I love called masculine birth ritual. And it's about trans masculine and non-binary people giving birth and parenting. It's awesome. It's, it's no longer active. Like they, they kind of stopped recording live episodes, but it's still available. You can find it anywhere you find podcasts. And that's a really great one to listen to. Right. I will make sure I actually just noted that. I'm like, make Sweet. sure I look that up. <laughs> like awesome. pen still in hand. All right. <laughs> we're going to take a super quick break. And when we come back, if you can offer one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer a new and expectant parents, we'll be right back. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Okay, we are back. So you've given such great information, resources. I'm so excited. Our show notes are going to be so full. But is there something else, any little last minute, just from your experience as a doula, as a childbirth educator, as a parent, is there something you want to share? I think finding community. And I think, I mean, we have so many options now with online, but really finding that community of like-minded people that are also going through the same thing as you. Mm -hmm. Um, 
is so, so, so important and not like, not like fluffy important. It's like, it's survival important. It's like, we have to find our community and our people. Right. And I think another thing that I recommend for everyone to do, especially now when we're all just like going through so much with our culture and with health and COVID is getting into that habit of grounding yourself. So that's Mm -hmm. like, I mean, even if it's, if it might be yoga, it might be meditation, or it might be just like putting your hand on your chest and taking five deep breaths a few times a day. And I think that will, will help you throughout your parenting journey because building and raising a family is like, (laughs) it's so a lot. It's it's so much joy and it's so much overwhelm and it's so much intensity that having some kind of a grounding practice of like taking a few deep breaths or meditating or yoga can really help you ride those waves. Um, and kind of get through each day because yeah, we're all just like trying to get through each day and ride the waves of parenting and getting pregnant and raising a family and just being amazing people (laughs) in the world. Yeah, it is. It is hard. Yeah. I love that idea of grounding. I try to do that. Just a few deep breaths sometimes is all I can get, (laughs) but even that can give a little mental space. So where can people find your work? I know that you're also a music therapist. I, that, little... I saw that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> she's very interesting. Um, Are you still doing that? I am. Um, I I do. I uh, got a degree in music therapy, and that's what I did for many years as my main job. What I do now, mainly with music therapy, is I write what's called womb songs, and they're original songs written just for your baby. So I use your words. I interview parents, use their words, and put them into music to create a song that's one of a kind, super unique. I can even incorporate the baby's heartbeat sounds into the song. And that's what I focus on right now. So but can I ask a question about that? Cause I'm kind yeah. of fascinated by that. So yeah. when you're talking to the parents, like, are you getting a vibe of what, like, do you ask them what kind of music they like? I and do. that is so Yeah. So cool. I find out like what music they like. I find out what kind of songs, if there's any songs they're already singing to their baby or songs that are really special to them that they might want to incorporate either like the melody line or some lyrics from that song into their, into this new song. And then you and compose then, it. And I compose that's it. Yeah. So it's, cool. <laughs> it's usually kind of a lullaby feel. So it's usually a song that's a little bit more like relaxing and slow. Um, but I can really do whatever, um, people want. And, and then I give them a recording of a song and the lyrics and I encourage them to sing the song to their kids because our kids our babies love the sound of their parents' voices. No matter if the parent feels like they're a good singer or not, it doesn't matter. Their baby loves the sound of their voice. And so giving them a song that they can really sing to their baby and have that be a bonding experience is really powerful. So yeah. So people can find more about that as well. Um, my website is hearttonesbirth.com and on there, there is a tab about womb songs. So you can hear some examples of ones that I've written and, and read all about what else, what else I'm up to and things that I do. Um, I also heart tones birth on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. And then I teach for birth smarter. So you can find birth smarter on Instagram at birth smarter or birthsmarter.com online. And they have a ton of awesome childbirth education classes and resources for folks. That is so cool. I'm actually, I'm going to start telling people like, instead of just gifts for post baby to yeah. do, I love the unique song. I feel like that should be, I, I usually tell people like, you know, maybe get a few hours of a postpartum doula, but I'm also going to share like, get a song made just for baby. That yeah. is, it's, it's a great gift. I'm kind of taken people. by that. You can tell I'm like yeah. gushing over no, that. It's awesome. I mean, it's a great gift. I often people will buy it for someone as a baby shower gift or as like a mother blessing gift. So it's, it's super awesome. I love doing them for people. You're so cool. I love hey. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for giving me some of your time today and giving the community some of your time. You really came well prepared with such great information to support the whole grouping of queer and trans and non-binary folks, because it is daunting. I can imagine to go through yeah. something that doesn't necessarily see you and see what you need. And yep. we need to show up better as a society and mm-hmm. as a birthing world and a birthing culture. So thank you for offering your information. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. It was awesome to talk to you. Oh, you're so welcome. All right. Be well. <laughs> thank you. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. 
Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.